Today we turn to the two letters that the Apostle Simon Peter wrote, both of which are addressed to a group of believers rather than a particular church. The second letter makes it clear that it's written to the same people that the first had been. The letters were written towards the very end of Peter's life. Peter was writing from Rome to a group of Christians scattered throughout the northern area of Asia Minor, which is mainly in modern-day Turkey. The group probably included both Jews and Gentiles. The Apostle addressed the letter's recipients as aliens, a word indicating that Peter was not just speaking to Jews or just to Gentiles, but to Christians who were living their lives in such a way that they would have stood out as foreigners among the surrounding culture. Peter speaks a lot about persecution, which anticipated the persecution he and other Christians would endure in the final year of Nero's reign. At the time he wrote, Peter had not yet been arrested, an event that would lead to his martyrdom. Peter focuses on the importance of believers bearing up under unjust suffering, yet continuing to live well. The letter provides encouragement for the true believer to continue on in the way that Jesus had laid out for all his followers. Peter maintained that this was the kind of true perseverance that God expects from his people. Having introduced himself and confirmed his audience, Peter jumps straight in with doctrine, starting with confirmation and reaffirmation. Our salvation is grounded in God's mercy. Despite everything we have done, God showed us compassion. He's given us a new life, one of the spirit and not of the flesh. He made us born again to a living hope through and by the resurrection. So we have the hope of our salvation through and by the one who gave his life for us. Peter says that we should rejoice fully in the death of Jesus Christ, because he's not dead, but he is risen. We are all challenged and indeed grieved in the various trials that we face, but one day we will pass from this life into the next where... If we have been saved and sanctified, we will be delivered to far greater things. We are redeemed by the precious atoning blood of Jesus Christ, and through this become heirs of God to the inheritance that awaits us. The life of a Christian isn't the easiest life, but it's far, far better than the sin-filled one you are living now, or the life awaiting the sinner. It would be far better to be found as a servant tried by fire and purified like gold than to be found wretched and without purity by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ today. We, as Christians, should rejoice when our faith is being tried and tested because we can turn whatever it is that is trying our faith into praise. We can turn our tried faith into honour and glory and power don't let the trials of this life defeat you, but rather let them make you stronger through our living hope. Peter says of the Lord, whom having not seen you love anyway. To that we could add, whom having not seen you believe anyway. Whom having not seen you trust anyway. That is what true faith is. That is what our hope is trusting in what we cannot see, and having faith in the hope of our salvation. That is our living hope. The main purpose of Peter's letter was to strengthen his readers so that they would persevere through their persecution with the right attitude. He did this by showing that God's grace provided all they needed for strength. In a broader sense, the purpose is to help Christians know how to live as strangers in a hostile world. A life of holiness begins with our minds. Peter says we can look forward soberly and intelligently. I think it's important to remember that many non-Christians seem to think that to follow faith you have to switch your brains off, 
But Peter says we can look forward both soberly and intelligently. This is not a blind faith. It's reasoned, thought out. The passage reminds us that the believer must have his mind or mental powers collected and always ready for Christ's coming. Sober describes a Christian who is in full control of his speech and conduct. Peter says that the only correct response to the sober and thoughtful attitude is obedience to God. He is indeed perfectly and ultimately holy. So we too, as his children, should be holy. Man is considered holy when his heart is conformed to the image of God and his life is regulated by divine precepts. When he is consecrated or set apart to a sacred use, or to the service and worship of God. The word holy in the Bible simply means to separate or set apart. Holiness requires separation from the secular to the sacred, from the world to God alone. This is not optional, all Christians are commanded to be holy in their conduct. For the remainder of the first chapter, Peter crams in a lot of fundamental doctrine. He's writing to people to encourage them, to challenge them, and to oversee their spiritual development. And what better way than to ensure they are fed vital truth? He reminds his audience that God does not play favourites. He judges, but does so with infinite fairness, which should encourage everyone to do everything with a reverent fear towards him. Peter brings one of the clearest summaries of the Gospel when he says, God paid a ransom to save you from the impossible road to heaven. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him for this purpose long before the world began, but only recently was he brought into public view in these last days as a blessing to you. Peter concludes that our trust should be in God who raised Christ from the dead. God has given his son great glory. Paul, writing to the churches at Corinth and Thessaloniki, linked together faith, hope and and love. And Peter brings these three together in his first letter. Our faith and hope can rest in Christ alone. And now we can have real love for everyone because our souls have been cleansed from selfishness and hatred when we trusted Christ to save us. We must ensure that our hope and our faith are grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we really do love each other warmly, with all of our hearts. When Jesus told Nicodemus that he had to be born again, the idea of a second life totally confused him. But Peter explained it this way. You have a new life. It was not passed on to you from your parents, for the life they gave you will fade away. This new one will last forever, for it comes from Christ, God's ever-living message to man. Our natural lives will fade as grass does. All our greatness is like a flower that droops and falls. But the word of the Lord will last forever, and his message is the good news which was preached to you. God wants us to have a new way of life, and it includes a life of holiness and reverence. All of us who are true believers are in Christ and are his ambassadors serving him. As we continue to follow after him, we are continuously b being built up in him. and We certainly need that in the very anti-Christian society in which we live. As a result, we are partakers of his nature in us. Christ, the living stone, is holy. If we are a part of his house, then we must be holy in order to be used by him. The stone laid in Zion is none other than Christ. 
Under unimaginable persecution, Peter encourages those displaced believers that they will have nothing to be ashamed of, especially when Christ returns, as long as we have placed our trust fully in him. We are God's house. Building a house takes a lot of planning and teamwork. We have to ask ourselves, are we part of a team? There are no lone rangers in Christianity. An army does not win a battle with one soldier, but with many. The Three Musketeers' motto was, all for one and one for all. If we're going to allow God to build us up, we're going to manifest it by our holy lifestyle and by our unity, one for all and all for one. The nature of Christ is holy, and so we must be holy. We must also be prepared to understand the ramification of that calling as his ambassadors. Christ the living stone is precious. Peter says the stone that was rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone, the most honoured and important part of the building, adding, He is the stone that some will stumble over, and the rock that will make them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. The truth is offensive to the unsaved, because it exposes their deeds and brings them into direct confrontation with the holiness of God. A holy life will expose and attack the sin in our lives and the lives of those who are in direct relationship with us. Jesus said that we would be persecuted for our faith. What Christ was saying is that sometimes the truth of God's word people see in our lives will be offensive to those who do not believe. If you happen to offend someone as a direct result of being a believer, then be encouraged, for Christ is in you and is using you. Peter then turns his focus directly on the people to whom he is writing. He says you have been chosen by God himself. You are priests of the king. You are holy and pure. You are God's very own. All this so that you may show to others how God called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were less than nothing, but now you are God's own. Once you knew very little of God's kindness, now your very lives have been changed by it. Dear brothers, you are only visitors here. Since your real home is in heaven, I beg you to keep away from the evil pleasures of this world. They're not for you, for they fight against your very soul. We belong to God not by what we have done or will do, not by our intentions or motivations. We belong to Christ because of who he is and what he has done for us. The nature of Christ is merciful, and as people who belong to him, we have received mercy. We too are to extend that mercy to others. We, as believers of the Lord Jesus, have a message of mercy and grace, even to those who are offended by the truth. Every time we sin, it fills God's heart with pain. But God has mercy on us when he had no reason to. The evidence that we belong to God is not just what we do, but it's who we are. God the Father is holy and merciful, and if we belong to him, we must reflect those attributes. We're called to submit. The Lord Jesus Christ was wronged more than anyone else in history, and yet bore all his sufferings with perfect patience, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. We are called to submit ourselves to the will of God. We are to perform our duties faithfully, whatever they may be, being obedient to our earthly masters. In our obedience we should be meek and humble, and keep our focus on God when we are mistreated. There is of course no honour in being punished for wrongdoing, 
But when one is mistreated for doing right, God sees what is happening and will bless us. Christ never verbally abused those who verbally abused him. When he suffered, he didn't make any threats, but left everything to the one who judges fairly. Christ carried our sins in his body on the cross, so that, freed from our sins, we could live a life that has God's approval. His wounds have healed us. We are like sheep who have gone astray. Now we have come back to the shepherd and overseer of our lives. Peter then gives instructions to husbands and wives in living holy lives in the context of their marriages. To wives he encourages voluntary subjection, but subjection to one who is an equal, not a superior. Any submission must never lead to an opportunity for abuse in any way. Real beauty comes from within, and that's what should be most visible. Peter adds the encouraging yet challenging call to wives with an unbelieving husband who would hopefully be led to Christ by the way that she lives. The appeal to the husbands begins with the word likewise, meaning the challenge to them is in the same way as to the wives. Husbands are called to live with their wives in an understanding way, showing honour to them, since they are co-heirs of the grace of life. Peter adds a very interesting condition, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Not treating your wife appropriately or honourably will lead to problems in the prayer life with prayers unheard. Peter moves on to a call to all believers. All should be of one mind. Differences of opinion should not divide us. Christians should always be courteous, caring for one another and helping one another. We are called to be different from the world, forgiving others even as Christ forgave us. We must not harbour resentment. We must not use evil language and avoid evil actions and behaviour with the peace of Christ characterising our lives. We must remain mindful that God sees and knows everything we do. We have to take personal responsibility for obeying God. We shouldn't expect others to change while we stay the same. We can win an argument, yet lose our witness at the same time. Peter uses the example of Noah in the flood to mention being saved through water. He contrasts this with water baptism. The water in this case may remove a layer of dirt, but the salvation is from the pledge of a clear, clear conscience towards God and the relationship with the risen Christ to which you are testifying. We're not earning forgiveness by being baptised, Jesus earned that forgiveness through his perfect life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. Through baptism, however, we receive credit for Jesus' work. That's why Peter says that baptism saves us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the waters of baptism, we effectively absorb the righteousness that belongs to Jesus. Having been given credit for Jesus' righteousness, we are now fully acceptable to God. God actually calls us his children. In fact, another good way to think of baptism is as an adoption. God has publicly made known his vow of allegiance to us, like parents going to court to sign the adoption papers so they can legally take the child home with them. Through baptism, we have been adopted into God's own personal family. We have a Father who blesses us richly, even though we don't deserve it. And he continues to love us, even when we stray from him. When we do return to him, he doesn't make us grovel at his feet. He forgives us and richly blesses us. The blessings of baptism remain ours forever. 
because God made a vow of allegiance to us, and he never goes back on his promises. But should we continue to run away from God in impenitent living or unbelief, we will not enjoy the benefits of having been adopted into God's family. Peter says, instead, we will suffer. Not just here, but eternally, and the fault would be fully our own. That, of course, isn't what God wants for us. That's why he gave us baptism, a visible reminder of his love. When you are unsure of your status with God because of your sins, think of your baptism. Don't think of how strong your faith is or what you've done for God lately. You won't find any comfort there, just feelings of guilt for not having done enough. Baptism, on the other hand, frees us from a guilty conscience because it's a vow of allegiance, God's allegiance and a promise of forgiveness. I love the fact that the ancient church celebrated baptism by feeding milk and honey to the newly baptised because through baptism the blessings of the promised land are now ours. Peter tells us that our new life in Christ is about right living. He says that God's weapon for us in this context is the mind of Christ. We must arm ourselves with that same mind. This is the new nature we receive when we receive Jesus as Lord and Saviour. This is with the deliberate intention that we should live for the will of God. Our goal for right living is the same goal Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Peter reflects on the sins in which we have lived in the past, concluding, what a wasted life. God doesn't want us to waste our lives on indecency, drunkenness, wild parties, false gods. Peter reminds us that some people will think we're crazy for trying to live the right way, and how true that is today. He also gives people a godly warning. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. God's judgment is coming. The only way that anyone can ever live the right way is through the good news about Jesus Christ. Continuing to look towards the future, Peter says, But the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. The idea there is that we will not get distracted by the things of the world, but will be intentional, serious and disciplined about our prayer life. Peter knew how important prayer is and how much it can do. God answers our prayers at just the right time, in just the right way, so we should pray. Peter then says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. The love he commands us to have is God's merciful, grace-filled, agape love. That's what the cross was all about covering a multitude of sins. And it's a rich, costly love that Jesus has for us. Human forgiveness is costly. Divine forgiveness is costly. God is love, but God is holiness. Sin must have its punishment, or the very structure of life disintegrates. And God alone can pay the terrible price that is necessary before men can be forgiven. Forgiveness is the most costly thing in the world. And God wants us to have the same kind of love for each other that he has for us. A fervent love that will cover a multitude of sins. Peter moves on to talking about hospitality and all kinds of generous giving. The church needs every gift that man has. Maybe a gift of speaking, of music, of the ability to visit people. 
It may be a craft or a skill which can be used in the practical service of the church. It may be a house which someone possesses, or money which they have inherited. There is no gift that cannot be placed at the service of Christ. So we are to give as we have received. And God wants us to be generous givers, because he is a generous giver himself. God also wants us to be cheerful givers, not grudging or grumbling or complaining. Paul went on to say, if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion for ever and ever. All of the goodness comes from him, so all of the glory goes to him. God wants all of our lives to be marked by right living, regular praying, rich loving, rich giving, and radiant serving. But we all need God's help to live this new life. Peter then says something which I personally find so encouraging. Don't be bewildered or surprised when you go through fiery trials ahead. For this is no strange, unusual thing that is going to happen to you. We live in a world that has a different God from those who follow Christ. It's a temporary world and time is short. The prince of this world is the devil who hates the God who created everything, including him and us. Peter is effectively saying, don't get lulled into a false sense of security where Satan convinces you that life is comfortable or life is safe. The people are basically unselfish or nice. In this place you will never see the lion pounce. And then you say, why did God allow this to happen to me? How can you claim to be participating in the sufferings of Christ if your goal is comfort and safety? How can heaven be the glory that you long for if you've made this world your joyful home? There are two kinds of suffering for the child of God. There is suffering simply because you live in a sinful world and you're not exempt from its fallenness. Christians get cancer, have heart attacks, bury loved ones, lose jobs. All the same things everyone else goes through. But there's also suffering because you are a follower of Christ. You don't live or work in a country that sentences Christians to death. But Peter makes it very clear that if you live your faith out loud, in the dark, then you will be persecuted. Peter says, if that happens to you, don't be surprised. Be filled with joy, count it a blessing, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? If you do bad things, if you break the law, eventually you'll suffer because of this lifestyle and these choices. If they do not suffer according to the law, there is ultimate judgment. Without a saviour, without salvation and forgiveness, renewal and rebirth, hell is forever. Whether you die in your sin or are living in it when Christ returns, Scripture teaches something about eternal suffering. The healthy, scriptural way to deal with our past, our sins, our hurts, insults, is through a life surrendered to God. A life lived under the influence of His Spirit. God is supposed to be at work within you, making you like Jesus. It's not easy to keep loving the person that hurts you. Maybe your response of grace, your response of love, can penetrate the darkness. Peter reminds us that God gives us second chances in life. No one is too far from the outstretched hand of grace. God cares for his flock in suffering. 
God actually uses suffering and trials in our lives to form and fashion us into the image of Jesus Christ. Peter also reminds us that the chief shepherd is coming again. That's where true hope comes from. This world isn't our home. He now brings three more gentle but firm exhortations. Humbly cast your cares, soberly resist the devil, and confidently stand in his grace. We are encouraged to cast all our cares on the Lord. Submission is the key to humility. God resists the proud. Pride is what turned Lucifer into Satan. Pride is what plunged the human race into sin in the garden. Pride is what stumbles every believer every day. In submission, I'm trusting that my God is larger than any situation or any person in my life. Our responsibility is to be right with our Heavenly Father no matter what he allows to come into our lives. As we humble ourselves, God will exalt us in due time. God never exalts someone until that person is ready for it. But God, in due season, at just the right time, moves in our lives. To just be content with what God is doing, let him do the encouraging, the strengthening, the promoting. Then all the challenging times of anxiousness and worry, we're told to cast them on Jesus because he cares for us. The original Greek text there speaks of a once and for all casting of these worries. It's not giving him a few and holding on to the ones we think we can handle on our own. It's not picking and choosing what God can handle. It's casting all of them on him. And then we are to soberly resist the devil. There is always a battle. In times of struggle, in times of anxiety and frustration, in times of peace and times of blessing. We have an enemy who comes against us at every turn. You want to grow and be used mightily of the Lord. Satan wants to devour and destroy you. He wants to devour your dreams, your ministry, you, your children, your family, your entire life. So be sober, be watchful, be vigilant, and resist him steadfast in the faith. Notice Peter doesn't say fight with Satan or rebuke Satan, but resist him. It means we will take a stand with the power of God's Holy Spirit strengthening us. And we're surrounded by a family who love Jesus and is willing to live for him no matter what comes our way. We must remember that when there comes a testing, we don't live by what we see or feel, but by faith, not by sight. My God is working on a far greater purpose in my life than what I feel or see. Yes, we'll suffer for a while, but we have faith in the God of all grace. Peter addressed his second letter to those who have received a faith the same kind as ours. We read later in the letter that this is the same group of believers who had received the first letter. The letter is again written from Rome soon after the first one. It appears that Peter had received reports of false teachers in and among the churches in Asia Minor. The apostle warned them about the insidious presence of those who spread heresies among the people. Recognising such difficulties is a sign of the last days. Peter wanted to encourage his people to stand firm and to instruct them on how best to do that. He emphasised the importance of learning and clinging to the proper knowledge of God. In fact, this concept was so important to him that the word knowledge appears in one form or another 
some 15 times in this short three-chapter letter. Peter asks an important question to all Christians. Has your life confirmed your calling and election? Too often, believers choose to surrender small parts of their life over to Christ, but for the most part live like pleasure-seeking non-Christians, whose only goal in life is to gratify the desires of their heart. While conversion is a big step towards knowing God, it is not intended to be the end of spiritual growth. Right at the beginning of the letter, uh, Peter says, Do you want more and more of God's kindness and peace? Then learn to know him better and better. While laziness certainly keeps many from trying to become mature, it is the yoke of defeatist attitude that typically holds many believers on the starting line of spiritual maturity. To combat the defeatist attitude of these babes, Peter reminds them all that is needed for a believer to live the life that God intends was, and will continue to be, faith in the free gift of his unmerited grace through Jesus Christ. Efforts to become spiritually mature fail when they are not grounded in the one who calls and enables his own to live holy lives. It is as though God's divine power that our minds are transformed into his likeness. In view of the great and precious promises and the prospect of sharing in the divine nature, we are to make every effort to grow and develop spiritually. For Peter, successfully running the race means intentionally growing in the following virtues, faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection and love. Peter reminds Christians that it was by faith that they were saved, and it's also by faith that they will become spiritually mature. Our society defines good in relation to loosely held values that change as one's circumstances change. For Peter, good must first be defined not by society, but through the knowledge of God's holy word. Being good relates to discerning and orientating one's life in accordance to the purpose that God has in mind for your life. The ultimate authority in one's life must not be oneself, friends, family, but God. For God alone is our creator and redeemer. With the love we have received from God, we are to love one another. How fitting it is that those who share one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father would acknowledge and love each other as one family. It should come as no surprise that the last virtue is love. For without love, spiritual maturity is an impossibility. Peter promises that if believers put every effort into fostering and developing these virtues in increasing measure, then the race they run in God's kingdom will not be ineffective and unproductive. Peter sums up this opening passage by imploring believers everywhere to make every effort to confirm their calling and election by living good and holy lives. While it will not always be possible to live every moment for Christ without sinning, Peter promises that those who are putting every effort into increasing these virtues will never stumble beyond recovery. The world and the media today have no respect for the Bible. Generally, it's considered a work of fiction. If this were true, then one wonders why some of the most powerful countries in the world, China, Afghanistan, North Korea, 
Iran, Kazakhstan and Saudi Arabia are so scared of the book that they make its ownership illegal. Listen to what Peter claimed. We have not been telling you fairy tales when we explain to you the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming again. The Bible can be trusted because it's filled with eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, not made-up stories. How can we be certain that Peter is really telling the truth? After all, couldn't he and the other disciples have made up these stories? Well, if that were the case, why were the disciples willing to die gruesome deaths for something that they knew was a lie? Some were crucified, others were stoned to death. You'd think at least one of them would have cracked and confessed that all the stories about Jesus were false, or at least embellished. On the contrary, Peter tells us that not only are the events in the New Testament which he witnessed accurate, so is everything else we read in the Bible, because Peter adamantly said, no prophecy recorded in scripture was ever thought up by the prophet himself. It was the Holy Spirit within these godly men who gave them true messages from God. It's no wonder Peter urges his listeners to pay attention to the Bible. It was placed in this dark world by God himself. Your living creator and saviour has written to you. And for what purpose? To lead you back to him so that you may spend eternity in the glorious and joyous place called heaven. Isn't that what you're after? A life free from pain, worry, loneliness, boredom. Without the Bible we would remain spiritually lost, and therefore end up eternally lost to God's love. Without the Bible we wouldn't know that there isn't anything we can do to make God love us. But thankfully the Bible also reveals how God took care of this self-centred problem of ours, through Jesus. Peter wanted his listeners to know that the Bible is all about Jesus, the Son of God, who willingly endured God's justice so that we could escape. We can't do anything to make God love us, but he loves us nonetheless. The Bible is God's beacon of hope and sure salvation in this dark world. It contains all the crucial information that we need. But the Bible isn't just information. It's the channel through which the Holy Spirit gives us power and energy to endure life in this sin-filled world. The Bible says that Jesus will return to judge the world. It's not just talk, it will happen. We are to keep focusing on this beacon of light, for only then will we safely arrive at our heavenly destination. The scriptures are quite clear on the subject of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but nobody knows the day or the hour when that is going to happen. Those who claim they do are quite mistaken, and they're doing more harm than good to the cause of Christ. One of the dangers of these false claims is that it destroys the spirit of expectancy. Another danger in this area is that it causes people to distrust the scriptures. Anybody can take a phrase out of context and make it say anything they want it to say. Peter calls them scoffers. The scoffers take centre stage and impose on us their interpretation of situations and events. Peter says they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. All of these scoffers have a personal agenda. They play into the weakness of many Christians, carrying with it the danger 
of developing heresies and false cults. In light of the danger that these false prophecies bring, we need to insist on doctrinal correctness and clarity. What does the Bible really teach? Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, the scripture has to be interpreted within the context of all the scripture. We cannot take scripture out of context and put our own personal spin on it. We must diligently insist that scripture is compared with scripture. Every verse of scripture must be compared to the whole scripture. We must insist on Bible truth. We must insist that our lives be conformed to what the Bible teaches. With all that is going on and all that's wrong with the world today, especially within Christendom, how can I have a calmness? How can I have a positive outlook with all the negativity around me? No matter what you're doing, no matter what the difficulty is that you're going through at the time, if you have something solid to delight in, you will make it through victoriously. Our delight must be in the blessed hope that Jesus Christ is coming. But I'm not waiting for the end of the world. I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This is my daily focus. It's not events I'm looking for, but a person, the Lord Jesus. My delight is in him. No matter what I have to go through, the trials and tribulations of life, my focus is always on the Lord Jesus. He is my delight. He is my hope. Without him, I could not go through anything. My strength and my help comes from the Lord. I do not care what happens. None of it matters to me. The only thing that matters to me is that I'm looking for Jesus. He will never disappoint me. I believe it's time to get serious about being a Christian. I'm not going to allow myself to be deceived by those who are twisting the scriptures to their own advantage. There's no political solution to our problems today. No government on earth can solve the problems facing humanity. No religion on earth is powerful enough to change the destiny of mankind. Only Jesus. The Christian has the true message. Peter says the Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The fact of Christ's soon return should have a great effect on the manner of our behaviour and perspective in life. Knowing that nothing on earth is permanent, that this is not our real home, should dissuade us from materialism, which leads the soul astray. Such truths related to Christ's return should influence our lifestyle and service for God. A Christian must always strive for balance, that is, he should neither be too heavenly minded, so much that he is virtually useless on earth, or too occupied with the worldly cares that he neglects his higher heavenly calling and priorities. We are just pilgrims and strangers passing through the earth, but on our way to heaven. We are, of all people, most optimistic about the future. While this present world and everything in it has already been appointed to destruction, we have been promised a new heaven and a new earth that are to come. Peter reminds us of the Lord's compassion towards those perishing. We who have been forgiven and redeemed should share in God's burden to persuade men to repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's coming is a wonderful day for us believers, a terrible day for those who are unprepared. Let us seek to rescue the perishing. Can a world that has rejected God and his Son 
doubted the Bible, despised the gospel of Christ, ever get better? Can a sinful mankind who has disregarded the only remedy for sin and eternal condemnation ever be safe and sound? No to both. We who are in the world yet not of it are to find hope, peace and inspiration in the Lord who will soon leave his throne to come for us. Prayer, Bible study, scripture meditation and memorization, worship, fellowship, witnessing, discipleship and ministering are just some of the essential elements of spiritual growth. If Christ is indeed your Lord and Saviour, you must strive to grow steadily and deeply in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is actually a sin not to grow spiritually, seeking our Lord. If you would like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide. Or, if you're in the Radstock area one Sunday morning, why not come along and join us for our half past ten service? You will always be very welcome.